I'm Florina Linko, uh, as you mentioned, executive advisor for the Methuselah Foundation. It essentially means I just do whatever needs doing. Um, but it's an honor to be here among esteemed leaders in the longevity and healthy life extension uh, field, uh, among you leaders here. Uh, very smart people in this room, so it's quite intimidating, uh, but I'll do my best. So I'm here to talk about animal-free precision uh, medicine. Uh, I was only 17 years old uh, pursuing my degree in nursing um, when a friend of mine, a very close uh, family friend, was diagnosed with stage four terminal breast cancer. Uh, the oncologist didn't give her much time she told no one about it, um, but I noticed her struggling to go to the bathroom. And this person, uh, Annie, could run circles around anyone. Um, she was in her 50s at the time. So it wasn't a, a hard decision to make uh, to skip my fall semester, pack my bags, and move into her home to take care of her uh, until she passed. But I figured, you know, if I was going to care for patients, that I would care for my loved ones first um, and make sure that they were comfortable and that their quality of life was as high as it could be until the end. So when David Goebel approached me with his dream of animal-free precision medicine, with the dream of one day perhaps an oncology uh, cancer patient um, being able to obtain truly personalized medicine that was tested on their tissue and uh, tailor-made just for them, it became a shared dream. And I hope um, our dream can be a shared vision with many here. So why, uh, why um, animal-free precision medicine? Uh, it's because humans and animals urgently need a model that works. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of these statistics here, but 90% uh, is the, dis the dismal, abysmal failure rate of drugs tested on animals in clinical trials. Uh, the average cost for developing an oncology drug, for example, with animal testing is two to $5 billion, and it's a lengthy process. Average time it takes to bring a new drug to the market is 12 to 15 years. And globally, it's 26 million plus animals that are sacrificed for testing and research. So uh, beyond this, animal testing can be unreliable and ineffective. Some human diseases cannot be accurately reproduced in animals. Animal results often do not predict a medicine's impact on human beings. We are, not, we are simply not mice. Um, and animal testing does not prevent risks to human participants in clinical trials either. Uh, it requires very expensive infrastructure for housing, maintaining, and overseeing use uh, of these animals as well. And I believe this was socialized uh, yesterday, um, but this is from the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development Briefing. Um, from discovery to FDA approval, a new drug, as mentioned, takes at least 10 years on average, costs an average of $2.6 billion, and less than 12% of medicines that make it into phase two clinical trials will be approved by the FDA. Um, this is obviously, as I mentioned, costly, lengthy, and risky, this entire uh, drug R&D process. So this is the Cliffs of Insanity. Uh, I don't know if if most of you would get this reference, but um, it's one of my uh, favorite um, movie scenes in The Princess Bride, when Physique, who's Andre the Giant, is forced to carry The Princess Bride, Inigo Montoya, and um, that other guy, I always forget his name, um, up the cliffs of insanity on nothing but a rope. And uh, to us, this is what it, what it seems to be like for the whole drug R&D process, right? Um, it feels like having to climb up a rope at the cliffs of insanity, having to carry three other bodies with you. Um, why do that if we don't have to do that? If we can disrupt this R&D process, then why not do that uh, and save lives, both human and animal? So we feel that it's time for true precision medicine to extend the healthy human lifespan. Um, you hear precision medicine, you hear personalized healthcare. These seem to be buzzwords without much 
uh, going on on, those, in, on that front. But we, Methuselah Foundation, are on a mission to accelerate a new era of precision medicine with bioprinted human tissue uh, that causes no harm to animals or humans, actually drives clinical accuracy, speed, and the best patient outcomes. So we have outlined three objectives here for this. <clears throat> we want to dramatically improve efficacy and efficiency of drug development, remove the need for animals in medical testing and drug, uh, and drug test, medical trials and drug testing, and significantly reduce patient risks in clinical trials. I would give anything if I could turn back the, the hands of time and go back to Annie and tell her that we can bioprint her tissue, we can test on that tissue, and a drug personalized just for her could be given to her to help her maintain quality of life and help her extend her lifespan. I would give, I would give anything for that. And so that's why I'm here and working with the Methuselah Foundation on this. So we were inspired by this case study from the SAE, the Society of Autom Automotive Engineers, uh, who outlined a high-level roadmap for autonomous or self-driving vehicles. Of course, it starts with current state today, with humans only driving. Um, then it progresses to more modern vehicles where a couple of functions like cruise control and lane centering are automated. Then at stage four, human driving is an option while the vehicle performs all safety critical driving uh, functions. And finally, full autonomy is achieved at stage five where the human is actually no longer required, um, not even an option. So inspired by this roadmap, we collaborated with a large group of subject matter experts uh, as clinical advisors to outline six high-level prog progressive milestones for how we can get there to true animal-free precision medicine. Um, so we're taking us here from the current state of animal testing, conventional animal testing, to animal-free precision medicine. So our current state, uh, I don't have to reiterate um, the bullet points that I mentioned earlier, but um, early progress would be initial prototypes. Um, early proprietary solutions to replace animal testing, limited standardization. Uh, so subtle differences in lab conditions actually drive conflicting outcomes, come to find. And rocky regulations. So globally, regulations actually wildly vary. So that in itself is quite concerning. Near-term progress looks like uh, perhaps 50% success rate for drug approval. approval. Uh, versus 90% failure rate. Better standardization, expanded standardization for greater reliability and reproducibility. And human models. So it would be great for federal law to actually allow for human models to be equal to animal models. Midterm progress, this is the golden milestone here, means greater success rate. We're thinking 75% success rate for drug approval via, versus a 50% failure rate tissue that actually mimics organs, right? So bioengineered tissue that mimics live human organs and human on a chip, the development of first human on a chip solutions. So uh, the Methuselah Foundation hosted the Vascular Tissue Challenge with NASA, um, the New Organ Prize. In our minds, the, those are uh, foundational to this program here and eventually Ideally, the holy grail is to achieve whole organ regeneration. And um, there's this uh, trophy here because um, uh, Methuselah Foundation is looking to, of course, um, host a um, open innovation prize and challenge around this. But ultimately, where do we wanna get to? We want to get to personalized drugs real personalized drugs, where ethical drugs are custom tested and made for patients. We want to get to improved outcomes where, where uh, risks for patients are significantly reduced in clinical trials. And of course, healthy life extension. The motto of Methuselah is to uh, make 90 the new 50 by 2030 for anybody. And that is ultimately what we are driving at. Oh. Uh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay, yes, so I mentioned the prize. Um, 
we are going to be hosting an Animal Free Precision Medicine Innovation Prize. So we are committed to 500K and seeking a matching partner, whether that be a government agency or even a biopharma or a pharmaceutical company, uh, for a minimum of $1 million um, internationally to drive 75% success rate for drug approval, normalize bioengineered tissue that mimics live human organs, and develop the first human on a chip solution for drug development. We feel that this is absolutely achievable. Um, and so we're looking uh, for an agency like the FDA or the NIH to partner with, or even a, a biopharma company like uh, Johnson & Johnson or Pfizer or the like. So we have developed a manifesto. This is Methuselah's position on the why of animal-free precision medicine and why people should care. Um, so if you scan the QR code, you'll go directly to that manifesto and we ask you to sign to show your support. Um, we are working with organizations that drive for um, longevity and human, um, healthy human life extension uh, with policy with, uh, and advocacy groups um, as well. And so we are very serious about this. With this is going to take a significant amount of effort from multiple parties and powerful people to make happen. Um, and so we hope that you would show your support by signing this manifesto. Come to us, to me. Dane Goebel is here too, co-founder of Methuselah, Sergio Ruiz. Um, and so we're here to answer any questions. Feel free to approach us at any time. And now I believe it is time to uh, introduce David Goebel, um, CEO and founder of Methuselah. Over 20 years ago, it occurred to me that life insurance is misnamed. It's really death insurance. Of course, nobody would want to buy it if it was called death insurance, but that is exactly what it is. So I asked myself, what would be the opposite of death insurance? Well, the answer came very quickly and easily. It would be insurance that worked to keep you alive. And that would, that would be a good thing. It would be good for the insurance company because they would never have to pay out a claim if you didn't die. And certainly on an actuarial basis, they could offer lower rates. So this was 20 years ago, and there wasn't really much that was credible that could actually accomplish such a thing. But it also occurred to me that what we could do <clears throat> is instead of having it be a for-profit uh, contract, we could have it take the profits and turn it into a nonprofit donation. A donation that would fund medical research, policy initiatives, and other actions that would not just help a single contract holder, but everybody. And everybody would be in a common cause. There could even be um, occasional updates that would look at your health. And every six months or so, if you're doing good, with your uh, health, lower your premiums. And alternatively, if you fall off the wagon, maybe once a year, your premium would go up. I thought of that as a vaccination, a vaccination of a financial kind. And that is, uh, over time, uh, it can be difficult to stay on a regimen where you aren't exactly sure that it's really helping because you won't know until you're perhaps 90, that it really did make a difference. But on a population basis, you can definitely see a difference. And so another benefit of what I call now e-longevity protection <clears throat> is that we can get large population data from those who choose to sign up. In addition, I thought about the cryonics community and their desire to get a last chance. 
And I thought, wouldn't it be good to get the last chance before you die? There are many medical technologies that are, are emerging that may be illegal in one uh, domain and perfectly illegal in another domain. But how do you get access to that? Even more importantly, how could you even afford it? What if you had to go to Switzerland in order to reach the uh, ability to have a treatment? So that added a wrinkle to the e-longevity protection concept, and that is last chance, right to try, rider. How that works is fairly simple. Uh, it's a $50,000 uh, accelerated benefit where if you receive a medical diagnosis from your personal doctor or a specialist and a, an independent board certified physician's agreement that you're terminal within 12 months, then that money would become available for uh, trials. It would become available for transportation for you and a significant other in order to give you a last chance. And so, that was over 20 years ago. What was missing? Well, the first thing that was missing was there was nothing that you could do at that time to really move the needle longevity-wise. And that has changed. Uh, at least we believe so. For instance, uh, I take rapamycin and metformin. I do not have diabetes, and I have never had a liver transplant when I take them prophylactically. Now, interestingly enough, about six months ago, uh, I went to get a new insurance policy, life insurance policy. I uh, applied to several companies and almost all the companies, except for one, said no. Well, why? Well, the first reason is uh, I'll be 70 in December. So there's a legitimate, I guess, age discrimination if you look at things on a statistical basis. But also the real pillar was that I was trying to extend my healthy lifespan by using rapamycin and metformin. Well, when their underwriters saw that, they immediately made the connection that I must have had a transplant and I must have type 2 diabetes, so forget about it. But I did find one company that was willing to listen. <coughs> uh, it was uh, Lincoln Life, just in case you want to write it down. <laughs> uh, so how that worked was it took about five months for me to get to the point where I could actually get a life insurance uh, policy from them. And again, the big bugaboo was the rapamycin and the metformin. And they did a very deep search. I can't imagine how they can make a profit given all of the time that they spent on my case. But here's what happened. If it were not for the rapamycin and metformin, my monthly premium would have been $238 a month. But because I was taking rapamycin, it was $650 a month. So I'm being penalized for trying to do the best I can to not make a claim with them. <laughs> you would think they would like that. Well, it's still too early. So another element of the e-longevity protection idea is that it would prefer um, contracts with people who want to stay healthy, want to extend their lifespan, and are willing to take uh, well-documented um, interventions uh, in order to keep their life going. So today we're announcing that we're actually going to do this product. Why is it called e-longevity protection? Uh, on May 12th, 2021, Vitalik Buterin donated 43.2% of the 
token, Dojalon Mars, with the symbol E-L-O-N, to the Methuselah Foundation. And that solved one of the major problems that we had with the idea. And that is backup capitalization reserves. If you have a situation where you have an unexpected number of claims, you need to have capital backup. And so, to a large degree, that took care of it. So it's called e-longevity for extended longevity protection. We want to protect your longevity by giving you a last chance and also by creating communities, communities that work together in order to keep each other alive. In the 19th and 20th century, early 20th century, there was an insurance product called a tontine. A tontine was essentially a last person standing contract. <clears throat> you would get benefits from the uh, product and the benefits would increase as more people died. <coughs> so it was in your interest, if you were still living, <clears throat> for other contract holders to die because then you got more money. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there are many works of fiction and even some in nonfiction <clears throat> that talk about how sometimes there were very suspicious deaths as the number of people at the end of the Tontine period uh, began to uh, maybe hunt each other. So once again, I thought about, well, what would be the opposite of a Tontine, an anti-Tontine, where everyone wants to work together to keep everyone else alive and, of course, benefit from that personally? and your family as well. Well, what would that look like? It would look like uh, people who are longevity positive and active, who get together with each other in what we call huddles. In the crypto community, HODL, hold on for dear life, is uh, <laughs> one of the rallying crowds. <clears throat> Well, we've uh, taken that riff and turned it into a huddle, holding united for dear life. And the way we conceive of these is that <clears throat> individuals will start these uh, fraternal societies who will focus on aspects that they themselves choose of promoting longevity by their efforts, by their treasure, and whatever else might work. And that collectively, as the number of huddles grow and become active, well then, the Grim Reaper may recede into the distance. So we are, <clears throat> as part of announcing the e-longevity protection, uh, we're asking for those who would like to be first adopters. We're looking for 300. Uh, individuals who would like to apply to be part of the first group. The first group would have the first option to start their own huddles. A huddle has a limit of 120 persons. And if you want to know why 120, well, then look at uh, Wikipedia for the Dunbar number. The Dunbar number is the maximum typical number of individuals that you can know uh, by name and have a, an understanding of who they are, what they're about. So we have much more to say and no more time to say it in. Thank you very much, Aubrey, for giving me the time and the uh, consideration for how I'm feeling. I really do apologize for not being there. I feel like the last person shot in the <laughs> Civil War uh, went two and a half years without COVID, but here it is. So if you would like to get more information, uh, we will be, um, we'll have a website up um, by next week. And if you want to contact someone at the 
uh, conference, you can reach out to Florina Linko or Sergio Ruiz. Thank you very much and have a wonderful conference.